Today on Dealer Tech Tuesdays, we have a great guest. He's a compliance and risk mitigation consultant. He owned a dealership for over 30 years. Catch and cure undisclosed issues. Talk to Octopus, my good friend, Tom Klein. And we're off, Mr. Tom Klein. Here I am. How's it going, man? It's going great. It's good to see you. It's good to be here in South Florida. I know we've been uh, coordinating this one for, for a little while. We've It's been many states we've talked about doing this in, Virginia, yes. Georgia. Yeah. So we finally get to do it here in Florida. I'm really excited to have you, man. I'm, you know, I think that you're one of the, the most profound voices of reason in the automotive business, right? The guy that you... Like I like to call you the wolf, mm-hmm. you know, like the Thank Pulp you. Fiction. Right. Yeah, the Pulp Mr. Fiction. Wolf. Yeah, Mr. Yes. Wolf. Yeah. Yes. I, I thought about naming my company like the Wolf Company, actually. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that, it, that a lot of people would get the, the reference. I but, saw yeah. you show up in a NSX today so for, for, our, for our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, in all, all seriousness, I think that, um, you know, we've been hanging around and talking for a long time and. I think the perspective that you bring to the CYA, you know, the CYA cover your assets, cover your ass right. perspective for the dealerships <clears throat> is really important because, you know, uh, I like to, the first question I like to ask is tell me a little bit about your background. I obviously know that story, but I'd like to, to hear it for our listeners. Sure. So uh, I'm actually a third generation car guy. Okay. Um, my family started in the car business in 1925. So we're almost wow. at 100 years. Uh, so my grandfather was in the car business, my father and my uncle, and then um, my brother and I. And so uh, it's a, been a family business. And so I, we had our stores. I worked there for 30-odd years, and uh, we sold them in 2019, and that's when I started my consulting business. Nice, nice. What, uh, what, what brands? Gosh, we had, uh, I'll give you the whole arc of the brands okay. because there were so many over the years, um, including Kawasaki Motorcycles. Oh, wow. That was w- before my time in the business. But uh, let's see, Chevrolet was the was the standard. We had Subaru. We had Toyota. We had Volvo. We had Daihatsu. We had Buick. We had, did I say Toyota and Volvo? Um there was also Peugeot, and Peugeot is in the oh, United wow. States. Um, so we uh, and Lotus. Uh, really, we had Lotus back when uh, the Spy Who Loved Me came out with okay. the the Lotus, and you know it transforms into the submarine. Nice. I, think that, I think that was the Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, and so uh, one of one of uh, when I was on the sales floor, actually, uh, they were having trouble selling an old Lotus, so they stuck me in it and said, "Go sell it." Just go show it to people. I don't care who you go show it to. <laughs> Just go show it to somebody and generate some interest so we can get rid of it. <laughs> Did it happen to be sailproof blue? Uh, no, actually, there was, was a white one. It had a it, at that. I, I don't know a lot about Lotus now, and and but at that point, it had a, uh, a what they called a power key. Uh, it was a six-speed, and if you did, when you turn on the power key, it opened up the the engine. Oh wow! A- and um, I was going down the interstate. I opened it up. I was in fourth gear, doing 115, and I hadn't turned, hadn't gotten to fifth gear, hadn't gotten to sixth gear, and hadn't turned on the power key yet. But at I at mean, 110, yeah. at 110, when everybody else is going 55, it's fast. Jeez! <laughs> wow! So I slowed down pretty quickly. So you've seen really an arc of, you know, and just having that in your DNA, the arc of what the car business has been over the last, I mean, since the invention of the car business, right? The Really, the dealer I'm, model. I'm not that old, but yes. But the dealer model, right? It's like <laughs> sure. your grandfather went through, they, you know, they were begging people to have dealers at the, at the beginning, right? right? They were saying, hey, who will want to do this? And then th- this turned into this thriving industry that we have. So what were, like... What are some of the arcs or kind of odd things that you've seen in the industry over the years happen? I guess most of the odd things are based on customer stories mm. because customers customers create the oddities, um, some tragic and some awful and some hilarious and some you wouldn't believe it. And if I had been smart, I would have kept notes. Anybody who's just starting in the car yeah. business, keep a journal yeah. because it'll make a great book one day. Um 
but but I'd I'd say the the demands of the customers have gotten more complex. And mm. uh, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was on the sales floor, people love to come up and say, "Hey, I'm a friend of Mr. Klein," and so I get the Mr. Klein deal, right? And anybody who came up to me who said that, I made sure they paid more because yeah. I knew they were lying because I didn't know them, yeah. right? That's a friends and family discount. That's right. They, they got the friends and family discount. You might say I gave them the business, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, and so this guy was buying a van for his wife, and he pulls me aside and he says, "If anything's wrong with this van, I'm coming to find you." Oh, jeez. I said, "No problem. I'm here every day, right?" Just come on in and come right into the showroom, and I'm right on the showroom floor every day. Said it with a smile, and so anyway, so they, so I sell them this uh, van. I don't remember what kind. It was like a venture van back then, or something like that. So I get a phone call like two weeks later. People are just two people just screaming. Just I, I couldn't even understand what they were saying. They were screaming. And I f- after like, after a little bit, I f- you know, in between the four letter words, it's like you essentially they were saying you sold me a lemon. The car doesn't work is what they were saying. This is a brand new car, right? Yeah. I said, well, what happened? And they said, well, we're stranded on the side of the road in South Carolina, and I'm going to come get you, and all this oh, kind geez. of thing, right? And I said, well, tell me where you are in South Carolina, and. So I found the nearest Chevrolet dealer. I had the car towed that within an hour. Got it. Called the service manager. Called them back and said I spoke to the service manager and we're going to get you into the shop this afternoon. And this isn't going to be a problem. And I'm glad you called me and all the all the right things I said. Right. So get the car into the shop. The service manager's calling and he's laughing. Oh. He's laughing. I said, he said, well, we found out what the problem was. I said, yeah. He said, well, you know, these newfangled cars need gas in order to no. go. They had run out of gas. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so. It seems like the problem was between the steering wheel and the driver's seat, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, customers are, are always demanding, and I think their demands have gotten more complex. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, and have you seen in that arc our, our, you know, it used to be, it seemed like back in back in those days, it was like people were just happy to have a car that they could get to work to, and, you know, right. they were just, you know, brand, very brand loyal, right? If they were a Lincoln driver or they were Oldsmobile driver, they were just like, you know, my family. Or a Lincoln family. Or right? a Lincoln family, you know, right. they were like, hey, we're That's a Lincoln right. family. That's all we drive. That's right. What, do you think that over the years, just pe- the, the customer has gotten more educated? Have they gotten just, um, you know, just brand agnostic just something that's reliable what is that what is has what does that look like over the years i don't think that the manufacturers have done a lot to enable that brand loyalty mm. if you think about the car buying experience now and i bought my you know my my car payment used to come through my W-2, right, yeah, exactly. until we sold the dealerships, and then I had to go buy a car. Yeah. But what what does the brand, what have the brands done to engender you to come back to their brand other than maybe send you an email once a year or yeah. something, right? I don't, I don't, they all want to talk them, and, and they want to push the dealers to make sure that they're, doing everything they can to support the brand, and that's done through sales, uh, through service, of course, after the sale. But what are the manufacturers doing to help there? They're really, they're, they're, they're not, I don't see a lot of yeah. effort there. Now, you know, I've only bought, I bought one car, one RV, uh, and so I haven't, I haven't seen it from a from firsthand perspective, but I certainly don't hear of any programs that the manufacturers are yeah. are providing that kind of support to the dealers. Um, so I think brand loyalty, while it used to be a family thing, I think that went away as the years went by yeah. because nobody was supporting it in that way. I still see, oddly enough, I still saw that in, like, the South. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we're a Ford family or we're a Chevy family with trucks. Sure. You know that. Trucks are a little bit different. Yeah, trucks were like, they, but they still had specifically that. Specifically pickups. Yeah, specifically pickups, yeah. exactly. Like you would go into a. You're either a Chevy or a Ford yeah, or a Dodge exactly, or exactly. occasionally a Toyota. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. They have that, still have that brand loyalty. 
kind of perspective in it. But you know, like I was I was listening to some dealers talk about it the other day. But you know, what what I what I have seen is that dealers have become very loyal to manufacturers. You know, I hear incredible things about Lexus, particularly mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Lexus or Toyota as manufacturers being like being a Lexus or Toyota um, dealer is a huge privilege compared to some other ones that that just kind of squeeze the you know, kind of squeeze the life out of some of these these dealers and are just trying to, you know, like what, what the CEO of Ford was talking about. It's like eliminating the dealer completely. It's like, how can you, you can't get cars to, you know, have consistent quality over long periods of time. How are you going to manage, how are you going to, ex- how are you going to manage the customer experience at scale right. for 330 million Americans? Right. right? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. You need dealers to be in that, in that process to be able to, you know, do those, you know, creative things for that local market. So it doesn't, that, that's, I don't think that that's a winning strategy in general. Well, I mean, I would have some Toyota dealers who might argue with you, by the way. Agree. That, I agree. Um, I could see that, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, I, you know, I, I think that the manufacturers don't treat dealers like they're their customers. That's not how they're treated. Uh, it's like an it, adversarial it's, relationship. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's very much uh, a conflict there. Yeah. So, yeah. So the so when you talk about the trends and the arc, it's got to it should start with the manufacturer. When in fact the you know the customer relationships really start with what the dealers do, irrespective of what the manufacturers yeah, are doing. Correct. So the the good dealers are good community members and helping yeah. with the softball and the baseball and the yeah. sponsoring. You know all the things. As, yeah, as, yeah, as, yeah. As, as it were. Yeah, yeah, and that's I, that's one one you know we've talked about this in our community a lot is like you know saying like it's the worst told story and and one of the worst told stories in the united states is that the industry the dealership industry is an industry of second chances you know working hard and 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 pulling yourself up about making millionaires right Mm -hmm. if you're successful what you do you can be extraordinarily successful right and giving back to the community you know like really being a massive employer in the community and um, not only an employer, but also charitable causes. Like you see dealers and local dealers across the, the cities that are involved with March of Dimes, they're involved with, you know, Habitat for Humanity, all the... The, the fire departments. Yeah, the fire the, departments. The, the and they, police like, departments. Yeah, the, it's just... All and, the first responders. And, and, you know, the, the kind of the reputation is like, oh, that dealer XYZ and it's like, man, just like, if you only knew what dealers were doing out there to be able to support their community, yeah, you'd have a different story. Right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, I don't know that that they the dealers tell that story enough, no, or or yeah. make it you know make it part of their of the, of their story. Yeah, and and communicating that to you know to the public. Yeah, I mean, I saw something on Facebook this morning from a from a dealer. And it was a it, it was a short video. It was probably ninety seconds. It gave a tip on how to buy a car in that particular state, okay, and why they should consider trading a car in instead of selling it because it reduces the amount of taxes. Mm. And it's super super idea educational, to yeah. educational. And I said to the dealer on Facebook, you should definitely make a commercial out of this. Yeah. Uh, that kind of information is. Yeah is lacking in in the blogosphere, the metasphere, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the whatever, wherever you're living, the Facebook fear, uh, sphere, uh, getting that information out to people is, is hard to do. It's hard to communicate yeah. a message because there are so many messages and people just get bombarded with information throughout their day. I last statistic I read, it was like 3,500 different messages you see every day between, between – the advertisements you see oh. and the billboards when you're driving home yeah. and the radio commercials and all the stuff. It's like 3,500 different messages. So getting something through is also very difficult mm. to do. I mean, that's, you know, I, I saw the same commercial and I was like, man, this above everything is authentic. Right. Absolutely. You know, this is an authentic conversation that you're having with the public. You're putting yourself out there. And that dealer principle, I know exactly who you're talking about, yep. is Above everything, authentic. Yep, I agree like with you. You, the person that you see on those videos is right. the person that you're sitting down here and you're sa- having the same conversations. We've both had drinks with him. It's right. the same dude. That's that you're right. gonna have straightforward, authentic, more than anything. And I think that, you know, dealers that become, you know, dealers and operators that understand authenticity mm-hmm. and how to, 
increase the vibe or the culture of the organization and export that or give the public a view into that will create that authentic connection rather than being fearful or rejecting that traditional like, you know, big cigar jacuzzi in the in the general manager's <laughs> office, you know, right. keys on the roof type of of experience, right? Yeah. Yeah, I did that by the way with a friend of mine one time. Yeah. Yeah, the key on the roof thing. <laughs> <laughs> he came in cuz his, his I think his grandfather had passed away. And uh, and he said, will you appraise this for me? I need it for the estate. I said, sure, no problem. At the desk, there was a whole drawer of people that just left their keys. Yeah. And so I did the key switch thing in front of him. So I put it in my pocket, and then I pulled it out. And I said, you know what? You're not leaving till you buy a bleeping car. <laughs> and I threw the keys on the roof. And he freaked out oh, so much that after about 20 seconds, I had to show him that I had the keys. Because <laughs> I thought he was going to either hyperventilate or pass out. <laughs> so um, I know, you know, from your experience of, of being in automotive and generationally being in the automotive business, you've probably seen... You know, like I, I think dealers become myopic to their operation. Sure. Not absolutely. out of not out of, you know, like a, a lack of on their side, but just contextually, right? Well they're just there six days a week yeah, exactly. and when they're not there, they're still answering their phone. Exactly. And then you you know, you see your twenty group and you go to maybe you go to NADA and you kinda of see outside of it. From your experience, I think I think that it's uh, what would you say that is, you know, kind of things that dealers want to look out for that want to have kind of a different, that voice of, you know, fresh eyes, right? The external director, um, that fresh eyes that are, co- those fresh eyes that are coming into the dealership and seeing risk from a new perspective. Mm-hmm. What are some of those things that, I know you, you and I have exchanged a million stories about, you know, the worst case scenarios. Right. And I want to touch on that because I think there's so much value in having that conversation. Yeah. Well, first, uh, the first thing that I think, when I talk to dealers and we talk about risk at the stores, one of the first things I tell them to do is when was the last time you walked through your organization? Mm. Not just go to your office, not have everybody come to your office, but you walk through and see what the place looks like. Does it need a coat of paint? So, so often a coat of paint will do wonders for the way the dealership looks and feels. Yeah. It just, sometimes it just feels dirty because it just needs to be painted. Yeah. Um, not a lot of money to paint. Um, and you see risks. You see risks when, when you do do that walk and you do look through the service department and you see the extension cord run yeah. all the way from one side of the building to the other. And, you know, you, 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 talk to the employees and you see what their workstations look like and you see if there's any pay stubs laying around, mm. right? I can go in almost any dealership and walk out with a stack of driver's yeah. licenses and pay stubs and, and all kinds of personally identifiable information, which you know is PII, which is yeah. against the Graham Leach Bliley Act, which is $50,120 per violation. And nobody knows what a violation is yet because they haven't enforced it. Uh, to my knowledge, but walking through the dealership and and just looking and doing that once a month, maybe they'll get great perspective on, on what customers see and what their employees see. Right. Because at a dealership, your risk in, in, from my view always comes on two legs, right? Yeah. Risk is in a dealership is to, you either have customers that are your risk or your employees are your risk. Yeah. And that's where 70% of the problems come from. 10%, 15% come from unintentional advertising violations. Okay. Like I can go on almost any dealer's website and find big violations, big problems. Um, and then the other, the other 5 or 10 or 15% is everything else. But, yeah. but mostly dealership problems start on two legs. I, I think that hit such an important point about that managing by walking around. It's like the dealer going around and seeing if like the coat of paint and there's a urinal that's messed up and there's, you know, there's just the walking around, where's the trip hazard, doing the stuff. It tells you so much about the context and the texture and the, you know, pace and the rhythm of the organization by just 
seeing what's broken on the outside that those are always symptoms of broken processes on the inside right would you Absolutely. would you agree with that sure i mean you go to any you go to almost any place an airport i flew from baltimore this morning right so the restrooms were clean in the baltimore airport that's extraordinary mm-hmm. right Walk into a dealership next time, and before you go see the dealer principal, go go use the restroom and see if it's clean or not. Yeah, people don't want to come to a place that isn't clean for starters. Yeah, let's start there, right? If they're if they have to wait in the service department for three hours or four hours, and there's not a clean restroom, that's not going to be a good experience. Yeah, I don't care whether the car gets yeah. fixed right the first time or not. Yeah, right. And so some of those things, I think, uh, it's like. It's like if you go to McDonald's and you pull up and you want a cone. I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but there's a website called McBroken. M-C-B-R-O-K-E-N. McBroken.com. And McBroken.com is a crowdsourced um, website where they post which ice cream machines are broken at the at the McDonald's stores because they're always broken, right? I mean, yeah. whenever you go to McDonald's <laughs> for an ice cream cone, it's broken. Yeah, my kids and, are like, what? It's broken again? <laughs> right? right? Yeah. And, and so that's so frustrating, right? And the, a clean restroom is kind of like the same thing. That I mean, makes sense. Using yeah. a, kind of a weird analogy there. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. I mean, just, um, you know, I like systems, right? It's right. like the, the more organized a system is. I've heard that is, about you. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Um, the you know the more organized the system is, it tells you really about the processes and organization of, of the place. And man, managing by walking around is such a powerful process. That the dealer principal, you know, the, there's a saying in Spanish that says the eyes of the owner uh, fatten up the cattle. Mm-hmm. You know, like just sure. being around, you know, it does that. And yeah. I, I think that's, and then you can really start understanding what your risk is. Sure, I mean even even something as simple as, and this is going to sound simple, but so few dealers do this. Everybody's got a back lot, right? Mm-hmm. It's like it's like Fred Sanford's junkyard. Yep, is what the back lot looks like. Yeah, in that junkyard, problems are going to happen as a result of unanswered issues on all those cars. There's a story on every one of those cars, yeah. and if you don't have somebody looking at why is this car here? Maybe it's an employee who parks their second car there because they yeah. got no place else. They shouldn't do that. They should get those cars out of there. But each one of those cars should be identified because maybe it's a service problem that's been sitting there and there's an open RO that's been there for a year and the service manager doesn't want to close it out because they don't want to take the loss mm. or the they're waiting for parts or the customer abandoned the car there. Yeah. There's a hundred different scenarios of what you can find if you just walk your back lot yeah, yeah, and if you yeah, task yeah. your used car, your wholesale manager to manage that for you and to, yeah. and to run the license plates through you know the DMV system and find out who belongs to the car and what the story is, you'll be amazed at some of the stuff that you dig up yeah. that are really potential problems that are lurking out there that you don't even know about. Mm. Man, that's those are ticking time bombs, right? That are that are they are. Yeah. And it sounds silly, yeah, right? No, and no, it sounds yeah. Yeah. it sounds silly, it sounds obvious, but how many people have a process to walk the back lot yeah. and and the car that doesn't have the hood on it that's been there? for a year yeah, right yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. get, get it out of there if it's not your car you yeah. call you call your local tow company and have them do all the paperwork and give yeah. them the just give it to them and move on yeah that's um you know it's like there's man dealers are, are cursed in a way that their product is so sellable right that mm-hmm. they can sell themselves out of some of these problems and not necessarily have to deal with the ineffectiveness or the inefficiency of the organization right sure and it's like if you you know, that the problem is like something brewing is something that's going to take you away from making money. Right. Right. It's like you only have so much. There's only 24 hours in a day. Right. And if 16 of those hours get taken up by, you know, BS problems, you don't, you don't, you know, you got to sleep and you got to eat and you got to see your family. Right. Sure. So if, if those BS problems are, are taking up the majority of your day, create systems that can help you mitigate those problems from happening. And that's what you do. Right. Right. You say, check these things before your furnace explodes. Right. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, to do yearly maintenance on your air conditioning system. Like, those are the things that they're going to become, you know, I'm using that as an example. But right. another example is, do you have, you know, an OSHA program? Right. Where 
some slip and fall? Uh, are you doing ladder training for your employees? Are you doing all these things that are going to take away from you, your ability to make money and pour your time and effort and what you do best, which is sell and service cars? Right. The, pr- the problem, I think, is that uh, dealers, um, when you have these side problems, it takes the plow out of the field, right? Yeah. They stop paying attention to service and sales because they're playing, you know, corporate firefighter, right? And yep. They're hosing out problems. Correct. And so, so the uh, a governance and risk and compliance program gives you a systematic way to go throughout the business throughout the calendar year and to touch all of these things that can explode or implode depending on what yeah. it is. Uh, and there are so many. I was just on the phone on the way down here. I had three or four phone calls because it was an hour from the airport. And one of the topics, I talked to uh, uh, a colleague. We had a mutual client, and the mutual client was complaining about getting was complaining about getting a call from the FBI, mm. and said I shouldn't have to do this. Yeah. Well, no, actually, you should. Yeah. But the problem, the reason he got the call from the FBI, without going into a whole long story, is because he wasn't paying attention to the risk side of the business. Yeah, that makes sense. And he wasn't paying attention to, as an example, part of this was one part of it, was the IRS 8300 cash reporting, which mm. all dealers think they do right, and 95% of them still do it wrong. So, oh, so and it's a, it's a big problem because if the, if the government comes in, fines are up to $5.5 million in like five years in jail if they can prove yes. that, that, you know, you were willfully having a problem. And there are dealerships that get closed as a result of this. I know of one anecdotally, I didn't read it in the newspaper up in Minnesota, that the IRS ended up closing because they had $2 million in fines and the dealer couldn't pay it. And so they just closed Yikes. They closed the store as a result of not having a process to file the IRS you know, 8300 report when you, when you get cash. So, so systematically having a way to address all of these things is part of the risk and compliance part of of making sure that that's something that you're checking on, right? It yeah. go, goes back to the old, uh, a good manager is a good checker, mm-hmm. right? And 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 good businessmen have a pro, a, a process for making sure that they're checking on all these things. Yeah, on, no, all, that, that, on all of the things. Yeah, on all <laughs> the things. Yeah, yeah. That's what uh, you know. Alex Flores talks about. You know, inspect what you expect a lot. You know, and, right. and that's just really holding accountable, making sure that everybody has systems that you've built. Right processes in place to be able to make sure that you're that you're that you're effective and you're not going to be closing your doors because of some stupid mistake right you manage what you monitor yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and so you have to you have my opinion is you should be monitoring (laughs) so from your perspective what's the biggest areas of risk right now what are what are things that that have you you know that that keep you up at night for your customers yes so um the graham leach bliley act of course is uh is the most recent regulation to go into effect on June the 9th of this year. Um, it's a tough regulation because it's complicated, as you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of a, a, you know, a mile wide and a mile deep, actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, without going into a two-hour dissertation on the Graham-Leach-Bliley, that's, that's all, it's, a, it's tough. Um, it, it's, it's a tough one to, uh, to comply yeah. with. That's one. And I'd say the other the other thing that I'm working on mostly with my clients is dealers have that one time of year that they dread the insurance renewal. Yeah. The dreaded insurance renewal. And uh, that was my 70s DJ voice. <laughs> um, and they don't have an insurance program. There's nobody monitoring that mm. issue. And the problem there is... They have exposures that they don't even know about, that they haven't even considered. I went into a dealer group up in the Northeast uh, last week, week before, um, and we were talking about what possible ways dealers get sued. And I said, well, let's take a look at your insurance policy, and let's let's see what would happen in these scenarios, right? I, I, I always say you should play the what if game what keeps you up at night and what if this happens how will we respond right and so we pulled out the insurance policy um on as an example 
um, Truth in Lending Act. And the okay. Truth in Lending Act, most dealers have Truth in Lending Act violations on their websites. And so this particular dealer, we pulled it out, they have 300000 in coverage, which may sound like a lot, but when you consider a class action potential, if you have a problem on your lawsuit, uh, on your uh, website, let's say you sell 200 cars a month, you make the same mistake on every single one, Yikes. you multiply 200 cars times whatever the statute of limitations is, which is usually at least two or three years, right? So let's just say it's 200, that's 2,400 cars a year. Let's just say it's only two years, that's 4,800 cars times what the Truth in Lending Act is a $1,000 violation. So plus, plus, you know, if they can prove that you, you violated the Consumer Protection Act as a result of that, then it triples the damages, and then you have punitive damages on top oh. of that. And on this just one issue, the dealer had three hundred thousand dollars of coverage and didn't know because he because it's not something you typically look yeah. at, yeah. right? But the problem is the systemic problem is that brokers, for the most part, not all, but for the most part, they come in a week before the deadline. Yep, and they say, "Well, here's your renewal, and it's only a twelve percent increase." Don't ask a lot of questions, and they don't ask a lot of. <laughs> like, and they, don't well, ask they, a lot of questions. You well, got to say this now. Well, yeah. the reason they they don't have time. Yeah. The dealer doesn't have time to ask questions. And if all the insurance renews on the same date, there's no way you can ask questions because it's nope. too complicated. Yeah. And there's too many questions to ask. Yeah. And so I recommend that you stagger the insurance renewals throughout the year so that you – and you demand of your broker, I want to see it 60 days ahead of time or I'm going to throw you out of my office. Mm, mm, uh, I yeah. want to see the quote 60 days ahead of time so we can negotiate. Insurance companies negotiate, John. Yeah. I mean, they they negotiate. Um, but you have to know what you're negotiating on and why you're negotiating. And maybe you want a million dollars on that one line because that keeps you up at night instead of 300,000 or 2 million or 5 million or whatever. You don't give yourself even the opportunity to try to learn and understand. You just pound your fist against the desk because you get frustrated that one week every single year and you don't do anything about it. And so you should do something about it. You should consider having a, an insurance review and understanding what's in your policy. Mm. Listen, it's not scintillating stuff. It's not, it's, 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 not it, sexy. It, it's, it's not sexy. <laughs> it's not as much fun as playing with an ad campaign yeah, for it, sure. Yeah. But without it, you could go out of business if you yep. have a catastrophic problem. Yeah. So having a robust way of looking at all that is one of the first things that I do in looking at an organization to see okay. how, how they might go out of business. What oh. might happen if they, what could happen for them to go out of business? What does that look like? And what does the insurance policy yeah. say? And in that particular case, the insurance company write a check for 300000 and salute the dealer and say, the rest is on you because yeah. now we're at our policy limits. And then you really have a problem. And those, Good luck. I, yeah. I call those near-death experiences because to, to get yourself out of them is really difficult. Yeah, I would imagine. I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. So what are what are other things that dealers can do? To, that's such a great point. It's like get write yourself an insurance program. It's like a, a cadence of how to review it, how often to review it, separate your re- renewal date so you're not doing it all at the same time, right? right? So you have time to process those things. But it's painful. Yeah, like, it's like painful. It's, it's, it's painful. Like nobody to go wants through. to separate the root canals, it, it, right? Right. And yeah. and as a as a I was talking about the pros and cons with a dealer. Yeah. And the insurance agent said absolutely we can do that. His very question for the dealer is do you want to put yourself through that pain? Oh. That was the question the insurance agent asked the dealer. Yeah. Right? And so, it, because it's painful, I mean, it, I'm not going to say it's not. It's detailed and it's, uh, you know, it, it's nitty gritty and it's. But in a perfect world, wouldn't not the dealer principal be dealing with that? Like, in a perfect world, you would have the teams that are in charge of those aspects of the business be bringing up, reviewing their case, them bring, you know, like that would be perfect world, right? Like, sure. let's, let's let's have a magic wand sure. moment. Which the magic we wand don't. is the CFO understands insurance, yep. which they don't typically. I mean, in the dealerships I've been in, that's the first problem. Second problem is it's the dealer's money. It's the dealer's rear end. So there's nobody who's going to care about your rear end like yep. you care about your rear end, right? Yep. 
And so um, some dealers don't want to, uh, uh, they don't want to uh, give that responsibility to the CFO. Some yeah. do. Um, but, you, but you really, as, as busy as CFOs are, as busy as dealers are, somebody should be tasked with doing it and get into it and make sure they have an understanding of it. But yeah. it, it is very painful. Well, once th- I, I think the first one's really painful. But then the second and the third and well, the gets, fourth and the fifth. And sure. Like, okay, so what has changed? What are our policies? These are our levels. And you have, you know, a calculator somewhere in an Excel spreadsheet. And like, That's right. Hey, guys, you know, like we have an understanding of this. We look at it once a quarter or every biannually or whatever that looks like. And right. let's, you know, adjust, bring down. Things have changed. The market's whatever. You know, the operation has changed a little bit. That's like, right. does this cover us to be that? And then you go through the pain once, and then you never have to go through the pain again. Well, you... You're continually, the, as you said, as you do it more frequently, it becomes less painful. Yeah. But it's still painful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going imagine. through yeah. it is still yeah, painful. Yeah. But, but I'll give you a good example of how understanding your insurance policies can save your rear end. I, there was a dealer um, that I cold called, actually. I read an article in Automotive News, and it said she lost $250,000 because of this thing. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. So I called up the dealer and I said, hey, you don't know me, but let me just ask you a few questions. I asked a couple questions and I said, send me your insurance policy. Send me this policy. I want to look at it. And I called her back and I said, put in a claim and you'll get your money back. And this was five minutes of my work. Wow. She got two hundred and fifty thousand dollars back just because of me calling her That's and saying, "Amazing!" And, Jeez. and so she didn't understand. You her, have a raving fan for the rest of her life. I, yeah. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. um, but she had, in fact, she had an insurance agent who told her she didn't have any coverage because he didn't even understand the policy. Yeah, that makes sense. And so she relied on him as the professional. He made a mistake. He didn't understand what it said. So, yeah. so, and so understanding where your soft underbelly is, you'll know how to protect it. Or when yeah. problems come up, you'll know whether it is a problem you can turn over to your insurance company, right? I mean, even that is like even pushing on your insurance company. And saying, show me where this is not covered can even, you know, do that. It's like, show me that this is not covered or this is covered or like... Having a little bit of that push with it, because the, the fear is always little, they're going to they're going to drop you. Yeah, right? it's not a little push. You know, I would it's, imagine it's a ball yeah. peen hammer. Yeah, yeah, I would, um, imagine. I would, I mean, I would imagine. We had a we had a um, power outage at the dealership. This is when you know many many. This is probably twenty twenty five years ago, and um, there's a specific section that says that if you lose power, what the parameters are, loss and of business, loss of business, all that stuff, right? And we were without power. I don't remember how long it was, three or four days, whatever it was. So they denied the claim when we put it in, and they said, well, the transformer actually blew up down the, down the street. It wasn't on our property. And what I argued, to make a really long story short, was the power stopped at our property line when the power went off. It stopped on our property line. I don't care that the transformer blew up down there. Yeah. And the way they had the language, I was able to say, you can't tell me the, prop- the, the power didn't stop on the property line because that's our property and that's where the power stopped, <laughs> right? That's good, yeah. And it was, uh, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Really? And so I got the insurance company to pay. It took 9, 10, 11 months roughly to get paid on that claim, but – at being persistent and going back and saying, no, no, you're not reading the policy right. It's your policy. I'm just reading your policy. Here's what the language is. Here's why I think you owe it. And round and round we went for 10, 11 months, finally got paid. Um, Man. But, but, and so it's all what the policy says. And then it's how you address what the policy says. That's art. That's not science. Yeah. Right. And there's a lot of art in, in putting in claims and, and uh, and making sure that that those claims go through and nursing it through the claims process. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So what are some of the um, kind of success stories or horror stories that you've seen out there in the in the dealership industry? I know there's there's some ones that you probably can't talk about, but there's probably <laughs> some that you can. <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, a recent in the last couple of years, I had a dealer call me and say, "I just had the DMV here, and they're here to arrest me." 
Oh, my gosh. Jeez. And I said, okay, um, let's talk about what happened. So, a lo- again, another long story short is um, a dealership bought a vehicle from a customer. Okay. The, the customer didn't even buy a vehicle from the dealership. The dealership was buying this guy's truck. It turns out the guy forged his father's signature on the title because he wanted to get the money for the truck, unbeknownst to the dealer. Oh, so okay. The, so the father found out about it and thought the dealer was in cahoots with the son. So the father went to the police and said, you know, the dealer stole my money kind of thing. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, and so the DMV came out and was there to arrest him. And so they hired me to unscrew that whole situation. Okay. okay. okay? And, and so what ended up happening is I got the insurance. So I had a conversation with the father, multiple conversations with the father, and the, it was the stepmother. The stepmother said, well, he's not my son, Oof. And so, so she did. Uh, <laughs> so she didn't care what happened to him. Yeah, right. The dealer was the victim in the situation. Right? He didn't know. He did, yeah. Um, so what ended, up, what ended up happening is I got the insurance company to pay off the father. Okay. And I, had, I had to go. I had to talk to the the Commonwealth attorney and to all those people on the arrest side and make sure that you know. Let's see if we can work this out and yeah. that, that kind of thing and have kumbaya moments. Um, but I was able to negotiate with the father to take a lesser amount of money than the dealership paid for the truck. I was able to negotiate with, you know, the, the Commonwealth attorney said, yeah, if you make the father happy, it's fine with me. Like we're not in the, okay. we're not in the, we don't, we're not in the arresting, <laughs> business. <We're> not <laughs> the arresting <laughs> dealers business for whatever this yeah. situation is. Um, and I was able to get the insurance company to pay off the father. I was able to get the insurance company to pay my fee as a part of it. Okay. And, and this was during COVID, and the truck sat long enough that it appreciated. So the dealer ended up making money on the whole situation, <laughs> <laughs> which he was happy yeah, about. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. But, but as an unintended consequence, and there's always unintended consequences, and that's one of the things that's part of the what-if game, it turned out – that doing this whole claim brought to light the fact that the title clerk at the dealership forged the signature of the kid in order to get the title work through while they were waiting for the title to come through. Just to like... Just to make things keep oh. going, and so the DMV investigator found out that she right because he was she was waiting for the title to be sent by the kid yeah. while the kid was forging the father's name. And so she, she basically, I guess, said, hey, listen, well, I know you're a nice guy and whatever, so I'll just sign this title work for you and push it through without anybody's authority. And so the DMV investigator found out about that, and so she had to go before the judge um, under a, a – I think it was – I don't think it was a felony in that case. It was a misdemeanor, and we were able to kind of oh. – we were kind of able to work that and say if she doesn't do it again in the next year that he – you know, that, that, yeah, that would yeah. all go away. But there are always unintended consequences when you get into these situations, and that's why yeah. when you're thinking about looking at your dealership and thinking about what could possibly go wrong, everything can possibly go wrong yeah. – um, yeah. and so, you know, what if is an important question when you're looking at your operation? Yeah. I mean, it's, and especially having, you know, that, that the ability to call a guy like you, you know, it's like, I know that I, I rest easier because I know Tom Klein's my friend and I can call you and be like, Hey right. Tom, what do you think about this situation? Right. And you'd be like, Hey man, this, you should look at it from this perspective, look at it from that perspective. And I feel more because an attorney is going to be. It's going to look at it from a completely different perspective. Absolutely. Rather than looking at it from like this advisor. I'm a business guy. You're a business guy, yeah, exactly. Right. I'm you're a like, business hey, guy. Hey, for business, you're, this is what you're going to what you're supposed to do. And it's right. like, okay, that makes that makes sense because I've heard you talk and we've had these conversations of you being in extraordinarily hairy situations and finding a way out through persistence, creative thinking, you know, resourcefulness, experience, like having all those things on uh, as wind in your in your sales, that really puts you in a position to be a trusted advisor 
for the dealership industry and and help people navigate really difficult situations. Right. That's that's what I do. That's why yeah. I said the analogy that I use that you've heard me say many times is running a dealership is like trying to tuck an octopus into yep. bed and the tentacles keep flopping around, right? And yeah. so I help tuck the tentacles and yeah. that's what I do. I, I was talking to a dealer the other day and he's like, man, why have we got to deal with all these regulations and doing all this stuff? Like he was talking to his team. Somebody mm-hmm. in his team was telling him that. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you can go be, you know, you can go work at Supercuts or, you know, work at McDonald's and not have to deal with any other stuff. But if you're going to make $40,000 a month as a finance manager, right. you got to deal with this stuff, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it kind of comes with the territory, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so it's just kind of understanding the the the, the risk topology of, of the industry that we're in. And if you're going to be, you know, buying time machines and flying and being very, you know, very successful and being American success stories. These, these are just some of the tickets that you got to buy, right? That's it. Yeah. That's it. You don't have to do it. You don't but, have to. But as my, I'm going to quote my wife here because she's got a, I'm, I'm writing a book, as yeah. you know, we've talked about it. And uh, this is in the introduction. Uh, but at the end of the introduction, when my wife's quote, and I agree, because this certainly is from a, looking at a, at a dealership, if you're not going to look at your insurance, if you're not going to do compliance, I'm going to incite her quote here, which is, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is, a, that is a true, true, true statement. And, you know, it's like we were, we were talking about this over lunch. Is like, you know, you've, you know so much about this is because, you know, as, as Kevin Deutsch says from um, Lexus of South Atlanta. Right. You've written the checks. Absolutely. You've written the checks. You've been there. You've had to write the checks to say, hey, I don't want to be in this situation ever again, and I can advise dealers to never be in this situation. And you have, you know, touched the stove for those moments, and you know what that feels like. Sometimes the stove has been on. I've touched it. I've left my hand there. (laughs) It started burning. I couldn't find a fire extinguisher. (laughs) It's a mess. I mean, it's a mess. It's, you know... Uh, I've resolved a lot of problems, yeah. um, and you know you just do, and uh, class action lawsuits and criminal issues, and you know all kinds of stuff. So, so tell me a little bit about you have a program where, you know, this is the time to do your shameless plug, right? It's like you have a program that it's like a subscription model, right? Where they can ask you a million questions. Like, can you tell me a little bit about that program? Yeah, so I have I have kind of two programs. One is called Tuck the Octopus. Yeah. Uh, that's TuckTheOctopus.com. Good branding. Um, yes, and the other, uh, and that's eight hundred dollars a month. And uh-huh. you know, you get a certain certain things if you're interested. You get some compliance things and some free time with me and uh, and Zoom calls and whatever. Uh, and then I have what I affectionately call the Wear Me Out program. Okay. Uh, the Wear Me Out program is unlimited calls, unlimited Zoom for a thousand dollars a month. Okay. And so, um, and and I hope in doing that 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 we establish an understanding of how I think and what kind of things that you should be thinking about in the at the dealership at the store. Um, people, you know, I get all kinds of calls. Yesterday, I got one and said. Should, it was a very insightful question, which is, should there be two signatures every time we send a wire? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Right, absolutely. I mean, 100%. there's, uh, I mean, and, and people get scammed on this all the time. I just all read. All the freaking time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story that's published. This is not one of my clients, but this was, I've, I've read the lawsuit. I got a copy of it and read it, and the um, the Pohankas up in uh, up in uh, Virginia, in Northern Virginia, they had a company managing a trust of two point four, two point five million dollars. The company was Aon, A O N, which mm-hmm. is a Fortune five hundred company, reinsurance company. Yeah. Correct. Aon was scammed and sent two point five million of the Pohankas' money to an account in Hong Kong. Oh. And the Pohankas were suing to get that money back. So this is a huge organization, yeah. right, Aon. And, and I, now I don't know what's going on with the lawsuit. I can only see what I read because um, it's public information. I yeah. got a copy and I read it. But, you know, two point whatever million dollars Aon got scammed out of. And they, from reading the complaint, it looked like Aon said, sorry, we didn't know or whatever. We're not responsible, and so we're not going to give you your money back. 
And so oh. that's why that's why those lawsuits. So when you get something which seems as simple as have two signatures on a wire, you'd think that a company as big as Aon would have whatever yeah. systems are in place not to send two point five million dollars to Hong Kong to uh, you know an auto group who operates in Northern Virginia yeah. and Maryland, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they just lost all common sense there. Yeah, we've we've always said that you know for all wires to do multi-factor authentication with that. So right. if they say, hey, you know the typical scam, and we've seen that a million times, and the FBI won't look at anything under a million bucks. I didn't know that. Yeah, they won't. From what I hear, this mm-hmm. is you know this is hearsay, so don't take sure. it as legal advice. But what I hear is that the FBI won't look at anything under a million bucks because there's it's so prevalent. So sure. you can lose a hundred grand. In a heartbeat, in a but, blink of an eye. But here's an and here's another example of what we talked about in the insurance that was at the dealer up in, in New England a couple of weeks ago, is wire transfer fraud. Mm-hmm. This particular dealership only had two hundred fifty thousand of wire transfer fraud, and one of the questions, an obvious question that I ask is, do you do DXs? Do you ever buy truckloads of cars from another dealer? Right? Yeah. Two hundred fifty thousand. The average. The average. I read Cox report whatever, a couple months ago that said the average car is now $48,000, right? Do the math, right? That's only five cars on a nine-car hauler, right? So you're self-insuring. If that ends up being a scam, you're self-insuring $250,000 that can be gone like that because your sales manager was moving too quickly because you need inventory, and you were just like, oh, cool, they'll buy. I can get inventory from them, and boss, I need the wire for $500,000, and it comes, you know, and all of a sudden you're out. $250,000. Yeah. $250, yeah. No, that that's complicated. We've, you know, what we have done is that we've set up um, in SharePoint. Are you familiar with Microsoft SharePoint? Yeah. yeah. Wire process, um, like right. forms, mm-hmm. right? So it's, uh, they, they have these, you know, they have these forms in SharePoint where you upload the document that you need and then it goes through and it sends the emails to the right people all internal in an intranet. Right. And then you have to have two factor authentication on it and then mm-hmm. it loads it and then it, puts it in a record Mm -hmm. and unless you do it that way you cannot get wire transfers to be approved through the the organization and and that saves a lot of risk yeah absolutely i didn't know that that's good to know that changes a lot of sure it does because now insurance policies are asking do you have a two-factor you know a Mm -hmm. dual verification they don't call it two-factor but dual verification for wire wire transfers in your organization they're asking specifically for that because it's so prevalent sure absolutely yeah so it was a good question by my client oh you know great question yeah and and yeah yeah that's a great question however whatever way you do the multi-factor authentication is is a good way because that literally is i'm in china i'm in a meeting i need to quickly transfer three hundred thousand dollars to this account right and you and what I talk about that is like the temperament of the dealers is an important factor as well there. Absolutely. Like if, short on if time, you're, if you're, short on patience. But if you're, you know, like one of those dealers that's a, like a firecracker you right. know, that will explode and fire people and doing stuff right. out of fear, they'll comply, which is in direct competition with risk. Sure. A hundred percent. You know, it's like others saying like always trust, but verify creating a culture of, you know, of always, you know, uh, of uh, creating a culture of, you know, creating trust, right, with your team and saying not that somebody in accounts payable is terrified of the owner and is just going to do something and not be like, hey, I know he might be at dinner or he might be at or she's at, you know, she's at some important event that I could be like, I got this call. I need to confirm this and go through that process because of the temperament of the dealer. Here's a good example of that. I had a, a dealer who was very politically active. Okay. And um, one of his political buddies had a, uh, a, a waste company, and he wanted to endear himself to his buddies, so he wanted to change the contract from whatever waste management to this local firm. And I said to the dealer, I said, happy to take a look at that, but let's look at his insurance. And he said, why do you need to look at the insurance? Not patiently. He said, why are you looking at insurance? I said, because I want to make sure he has enough insurance because otherwise you're personally on the hook. When it comes to pollution, dealers can be personally liable as well as the company. And he called me lots of four-letter words and, you know, are you stupid? And, of course, they're going to have insurance. And what are you thinking? And the pollution company didn't have pollution insurance. Golly. So... 
Jeez. Which is unbelievable, That's right? That's unbelievable. Yeah. So, um, yeah, because I kept asking for the certificate, and it's like they wouldn't send it. And the reason they wouldn't send it is because they didn't have any pollution insurance. They just just started. We're going to get in the pollution business, and we don't have pollution. So, and especially with that, that's that that goes all the way super up. Super fun yeah, sites, like, yeah, and all that, kinds that of that problems. That becomes a that becomes a mega mess. Mega mess. Yeah. So you're exactly right in what you said about they don't want to get yelled at. I don't mind getting yelled at. It doesn't bother me. But if you're an employee and not a consultant, no, of course right, you can give you can from you can dealer get fired. to dealer, right? From dealer to dealer, you can you know, pump your chest out and do that. But right. if somebody's in, you know, an employee in accounting and, you know, not even the general manager, that's like right. somebody that's approving stuff that's or right. doing that, they're going to be fearful of no question. standing up and saying, hey, I got this weird email, I want to do that. And right. like, are you stupid? I'm buying a car that, you know, right. whatever, you right. know, whatever that thing that is. That's right? right. And there's always the thing. Yeah, there's always the thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's always the thing. Yeah. Like I was at a dealership and uh, we were having a meeting with the, the CFO and the COO and the CMO and it was all of us at a conference table and somebody walked in and said, the dealer's Bentley is here. Um, and the CFO was like, what Bentley? And and so he picked up the phone called the dealer said, did you buy a Bentley? Yeah, it, yeah, it should be arriving today, right? And he didn't say. So I said, how much is the Bentley worth? And it was a $300,000 Bentley. I said, has anybody checked the insurance to see what the maximum per car coverage is on any car in the inventory? And it was one hundred and twenty-five thousand. Jeez. So you know, of course, I said well, we need to get a we need to get a separate policy written for the Bentley to make sure that the difference between the one hundred and twenty-five and the three hundred thousand yeah. dollars he was spending on the Bentley in case he had an accident, it's right? Self-insured. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So self-insurance is the catch-all of all things, right? Self-insurance. You are a self-insurance. We're not in the, yeah, we're not in the self-insurance business. <laughs> exactly right. He was in the self-insurance business. I haven't been sitting there. So, and the policy was whatever a thousand dollars a year or something. Yeah. It was it was, a, it was nothingness, right? But yeah. but somebody has to be thinking about risk, and like, you know, we talked earlier. Somebody has to be thinking about the risk in the store and what can be a risk and where are the you know where are the holes in the bucket, right? Yeah, yeah and so where the holes are in the bucket. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Well, Tom, I think this has been very insightful. How do people get a hold of you? You know, I know you're very active on LinkedIn. You're very active on on social media. So, how do people get a hold of you? And if they have to ask questions, if they want to sure. engage in your services, how do how do they do that? Sure, I'm um, easy to get a hold of. So, um, after my name and in, in LinkedIn, you'll notice a red phone. That's because I answer my phone. Um, <laughs> okay. So, you can get me through LinkedIn. You can get me through Facebook. You can go on my website, which is BetterVantagePoint.com. There's forms to fill out there. There's also a video connect button in the bottom left corner. So okay. if you click on that button, it'll ring right to my phone, and we'll have like a just like a FaceTime chat. Um, you can email me, which is Tom K, as in Tom Klein, Tom K at BetterVantagePoint.com, or my phone number is 757-434-7656. All right, perfect. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. I'm glad we put this on the books, man. Yep. And I'm, I can't wait until we do the next one. We'll do it. All right, man. Thanks, Thanks for having me.